Welcome to Day Zero Update for October 20th, 2024. I'm your host, Chris Ologi. I'm Brandon Parkin. And I'm Janet Victoria. And yeah, this is episode 500. Mm-hmm. Yay. Uh, Yay. Means we've been doing this for a very long time. Yeah, uh, yeah, we not, have. Not as long as uh, some people out there. Nope. Um, like, I know, like, the... Bombcast is in the 800s somewhere. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. And other people have podcasts that have been going for nearly 20 years at this point. Yep. Uh, which is a long time, but hey, oh, we're yeah. at 500, so that's good. Mm. Uh, we have a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Uh, there's been a bunch of news, um, a number of games getting announced or dates and whatnot. Um, we got some good industry news, sales news and such, and we got some bad stuff. Mm. Uh, we'll get to that stuff. And then uh, we got the Xbox partner preview. I had some interesting stuff in there. Uh, we'll get mm. to that stuff uh, a little bit later. Uh, before we get to uh, the news, we'll get to what we've been playing here. And I'll kick it off. Uh, I've been playing uh, a handful of things. Uh, I got TMNT Mutants Unleashed. Mm. The uh, game that is sort of a follow-up to the the recent movie, um, mm-hmm. I forget, I think it's Mutants Mayhem, that uh, was a very cool movie, a uh, very fun mm-hmm. movie. Um, this comes from one of the publishers that mainly does licensed movies, or licensed games and such, um, outright games. Uh, mm-hmm. They're not necessarily on the level of game mill as far as uh, making stuff that is generally not good. Uh, I believe they tend to make stuff that is fine find a pretty good mm. and i would say this is more on the pretty good side of things um visually the budget kind of fits the the art style vibes of the movie mm-hmm. um that kind of fits it pretty well uh there's maybe a few characters that maybe have had their skin colors changed to a degree like april mm-hmm. uh, who is black in the film her skin seems a little bit lighter than mm-hmm. uh what it was in the movie um couple characters that seem like that but for the most part all that stuff looks fine it runs fine um Mm -hmm. it's an action game uh sort of a co-op action game you can play two-player co-op uh which is a little bit weird that it's only two players because uh at the start of every mission you have all four turtles show up and then the ones that are not playing jump back out i was kind of hoping there'd be a way to maybe swap between them but uh, that has not been a thing so far. Um, I'm a few missions in mm. for it, um, but it has a pretty interesting setup because it's set after the the movie where um, the Ninja Turtles kind of are coming out of the sewers for the first time to really become a force for good and fight against the uh, the bad guys, which was Superfly and his crew of mutants that he rescued from the lab where they were created and uh here uh this is sometime after the turtles have kind of saved the day and stopped superfly um and kind of seemingly made uh mutants kind of in a more okay part of society at least in new york city Mm -hmm. uh so i guess the mutants are kind of integrating into society uh with some some pushback of sorts some fear-mongering as uh, as you would kind of expect, because the beginning of the game, uh, you run into some mutants and they they start attacking, and so mm-hmm. they kind of frame it as like there's something going on that's causing them to go um, feral or something like that, uh, start attacking. So you got uh, a lot of the early enemies are like uh, this fly that uh, has boxing gloves. It's more like a bee with boxing gloves that, mm-hmm. um, and you get a, another variance of that that can explode. Um, then you get a, a hippo that can does like wrestling moves and there's like another variant of that uh, mm-hmm. so far. So kind of a bit repetitive so far, but it's not been too bad. Um, and where I'm at, Rocksteady and Bebop are kind of friendly for a bit. They're like, oh, we're going to do a march that will you know, help people kind of see we're not here to be monsters or anything but they get angry with something and decide to run off on their own mm. they're gonna get back at humans i guess 
when they start becoming the the villains you might expect them to be uh which is not too surprising um i think that's where my next mission is at uh is to take on them um but yeah the probably the most surprising aspect of this game well as they're adding more new features and such is that there's kind of a persona style um calendar system in this game uh, where you are taking on uh, missions but uh, when you get them on your uh, mission screen it shows like oh you need to take this on in three days and in the meantime you can go hang out with people um not all of these are people from the movie i think they're probably created from uh either by the devs or i think they have a show coming on uh, going on that's will be starting at some point so i they may be characters that are from that show. Mm. Um, but you can go hang out with them. And it's like um, Leo, I think the one I've seen, Leo, he hangs out with April because mm. uh, there's sort of a thing. Um, Donatello hangs out with this kid that has a drone. Mm. Uh, so a nerdy kid, uh, Raphael, uh, wants to hang out with this uh, girl, I think, in, who's, who uh, hangs out at the swimming pool. Mm. And she has like a prosthetic leg, so that was a neat little surprise mm. uh, for that. Mikey has not had anybody show up yet, um, but you hang out with them, uh, get a little bit of like Bill story stuff. Um, nothing really super necessary, but mm. um, the main thing they do is they unlock uh, tears on the uh, on the skill tree. So as you're playing through missions, you're getting experience for all the enemies you kill. Um, there's also extras with the uh, these tapes that you find. Uh, they're not really collectibles as such. They're more things that either get dropped by enemies or, or hanging out in the environment or you break boxes or whatever. And there might be one of those in there that gives you extra XP for collecting those. Uh, so that's... a uh, thing that you kind of want to look out for. Uh, you can also get just pizzas dropping that it will refill your health mm. as you go. Um, so yeah, the, the XP you spend on the skill tree to uh, unlock more moves. Um, and yeah, the, the action is fairly simple early on because you're not really digging into the skill tree yet. Um, but you have your uh, two basic attack buttons uh, you have a jump, you have a dodge button, and you have uh, a run button that can be used for wall running and mm. such. Um, and uh, I forget what else there is. There's, a, I think, part of the dodge is you can cancel out of a, of attacks, or when you get hit, you can kind of cancel out to take to mitigate some damage from that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a lot more that gets added in through the uh the skill tree and yeah the there's also support abilities that i think come from certain characters so like one of them throws out a box with some pizza in it to refill your health mm. uh one will throw in shurikens that will do some damage to enemies um and i think there's a couple others that i haven't really read out too much but i've been bouncing around between uh, the different characters um Mostly been Mikey, but I've been Leo a couple times and doing some of the other stuff, uh, which works out pretty well. Um, there's no leveling to each specific character. It's just a general like XP mm. you're grabbing that you're spending on the, the skill tree. Uh, so that's been pretty good. There is uh, one collectible of sorts. There's ooze canisters that uh, boost either your health, your I think the, the skill meter or the special meter. Uh, for those little support attacks uh, that you can get. And there's one for, uh, I forget what the other one is, but you got to think four of those, and you upgrade the stats for everybody for that particular thing. Um, and you can do that probably at least a few times mm. uh, throughout, because it seems like it's going to be fairly lengthy for what it is. But yeah, um, you're doing a, um, a bunch of stuff there. Uh, I've gotten a, a cell phone thing. Uh, which lets you do kind of photo mode, though it's pretty bad photo mode because it's limited to what's on the screen mm. versus being able to move it around in 3D space and kind of 
frame it the way you want. Um, so that's a little bit of a disappointment. Mm. Um, the other one is like this AR game where you're collecting mutants that are you know, known known TMNT characters like Wingnut and some of these others um, that are in different spaces. I think mm. it's all in the social spaces. But the weird thing is that they don't show up until you click on the spot they're in, mm. kind of hidden, which seems to defeat the purpose of it being an AR game mm. that's supposed to show up over the area. As far as I've seen, they only show up once you've clicked on them. Mm. Um, I might be missing something there, because sometimes they don't explain things super well in this, but um, but yeah, so far I've been enjoying that as kind of a uh, a cheaper sort of lower budget game. It's obviously not as good as Shredder's Revenge, but it's pretty solid for what it is. So I'm definitely going to be uh, playing some more of this. Um, but yeah, that's uh, uh, the main new thing I've been playing. Uh, I've been playing more Metaphor with Fantasio, kind of still in the mm-hmm. uh, the big cathedral dungeon. Been kind of working my way through that. I haven't had a ton of time for mm-hmm. the game, but I've been working my way through there as a Dealing with a bunch of uh, zombies. Of sorts. Oh, yeah. That is, uh, easy, but also annoying. It's kind of really annoying when you're trying to uh, deal with their stun bar, essentially, before you mm-hmm. go into a fight. And some enemies that can just break through that, and others just, like, don't know what's going on, basically. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's really tied to sort of level they are compared to yours or whatever but some enemies just seem like uh, they can break through pretty easily and others just mm. can hit you and not do anything uh, it's, yeah it's like a system that I don't think is explained super well uh, it's a lot of it has to do at least starting out with um, being able to gauge like you know the the movement of the enemy does it look like they're going to strike and if they do you know hit the dodge button um, I do it. I, I will admit though that, yeah, at first it's a little hard to, to, uh, to consider. I will tell you though, that later on in the game, um, they sort of expand, they, they make it out so that, you know, they'll, um, have like a, uh, th- they'll be able to signal, make a clear signal to you that you're about to be attacked. I'll put it that way. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, I don't think the dodge is super great either. It's yeah. It's not like a Souls or a Zelda dodge kind of thing where it's mm. very easy to pull off. Um, you can kind of just get uh, into attack animations and kind of be like, oh, this is hitting me faster than I thought kind of thing. Um, but yeah, uh, the other issue I've been having is I've been trying to put... I have uh, the MC as the mage right now and mm. trying to put them in the back in the, yeah. the party menu, but they don't stay in the back. I don't know if I'm, I'm going to miss that. I need to hit apply or something, but I have to keep doing that every time uh, I go into a fight. Yeah. Uh, it did. Uh, I, I, I can't quite remember. I think it has something to do with um, certain like actions require you to be at the front. So it might, you know, but the game might automatically reset your wherever your position is. Um, yeah, that seems dumb. Yeah, it's it, I can't remember because it's been a while since I've been in that part of the game. Yeah, I kind of wish you would be able to just swap who is the attacker, essentially like the leader of the party. Um, maybe yeah. that is the thing, but it's like, well, if- you can actually, you can. Um, Go into the menu where you know your go into the part of the menu where your party is. You can uh, change up the order of who attacks first. Yeah, I've had that do- change for whatever reason. It used to start with Stroll and mm-hmm. change to Hulkenberg. Um, yeah, I, it, I don't know. I don't know what happened here. It changes uh, depending on when you get a new person in the party. Yeah, but this was with them for a while. Ah. Uh. Or it seems like it's changed. No. It doesn't always tell you this stuff super clearly, like, why is this changing? But it also might just be, I don't know, attacks changing differently? I don't know. That's what I would think. I don't know, because I remember Stroll getting the, like, big hits 
uh, when I do the squad attack, but then has been Hulk and Burns. Like, I don't know, maybe me trying to change the the front and back part of the party, change that somehow, and I didn't realize it. Oh. Um, but yeah, I do like that the they tell you exactly how many days you need to beat the, the dungeon. That's a nice oh. little change from uh, some of the Persona stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, as well as you have side quests and such that are also like, you got to do this in X amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of make it easier so you know that, like, okay, I don't have to rush this dungeon mm-hmm. if I don't want to. Yeah, because um, fortunately, most of the side quest stuff doesn't have a deadline. Yeah, so that's been nice. Um, but yeah, that's been pretty much it for Metaphor Refantasio. Uh The other game I've been playing some of is All You Need Is Help, the uh, the game from Q Games, mm-hmm. makers of the Pixel Jump series. Uh, this is on everything. It's on Game Pass as well. Mm-hmm. And I was sort. It's a co-op puzzle game that I was lamenting the ability to just play it solo and kind of swap between the uh, the four characters. So I ended up figuring out a way to play it solo, uh, mm-hmm. which is that you need two controllers, uh, and you put each controller into duo mode, so you control two of the four characters. Uh, with each oh, yeah. controller, and it essentially divides the controllers up like it's a, a Joy-Con, which makes me think this was designed for Switch first, oh. uh, despite the fact that it's been mostly Xbox marketing. Um, but you use oh. each stick for a different character, mm-hmm. then you use the face buttons or the D-pad, depending on you know which side you're using. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's only like two buttons you really have to care about on those. Uh, one for plopping down your character to put them in a place, or there's another one that's uh, more for UI stuff. Mm. Uh, when you get back to the uh, the hub area, mm. uh, you get coins for beating puzzles, and you can go spend that on a gotcha machine that unlocks new cosmetics for your character. Mm-hmm. And the thing I do recommend if you're playing all four by yourself is change them to each uh, being a different creature. Because mm-hmm. uh, otherwise you get the same lines and the same voice acting for each one. Mm. So then you go into a puzzle and you're hearing the same line being reported, re, uh, uh, being played four times in a row. Mm. Like when it, you know, in, when in you go into a, uh, a puzzle level, um, every character has a line when they start. And mm. if you're, want to keep your sanity, you want to make sure they're all different ones. Because oh. um, the other annoying thing is when you're moving characters around, they'll just say things, uh, especially if they've been sitting for a while. They're like, oh, I feel like singing, and it's like, okay. Makes, this makes it feel like this was made for very young children. Oh. And not, you know, adults. Oh. But um, they have a decent variety of puzzle levels. There's at least like a handful of them uh, from your basic type that's uh, kind of a version of like a, a Tengram puzzle. Mm-hmm. Those kind of wooden block puzzles. You kind of fit these oddly shaped blocks into the spots you need to mm-hmm. um, kind of thing. Um, but each of the characters um, gets a block spot you know, spawning around them mm-hmm. in a way that's uh, uh, changes things up a bit. It's not, it's not always like the same ones you get some often like Tetris style shapes mm. kind of thing, but um, sometimes it's just like oh they have one one extra block so it's like a a short little two two block pattern kind of thing. Um, you kind of just move around. Um, they don't you don't rotate any of the characters. Uh, the way you do that is by either bumping into the environment or against mm. the other characters to get them to turn uh, their shape around uh, to fit what you need. Uh, that kind of thing, uh, which works pretty well uh, for the most part. Uh, the only time it kind of doesn't is when you get to uh, some more later area puzzles that uh, you find you figure out like some of the easier characters to put down, and then realize, oh, I got to get this one through this tight space, oh. and that can be tougher when they're not rotated properly and all that. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty fun time. Um, they have a couple other types, like some that are based on um, you want to set your characters down and spawn a 
ball that rolls into the stage. So you kind of have to have a couple characters there to kind of keep it from rolling off the the level uh, where you have to respawn it again. You kind of push it around lightly as you kind of guide it around mm-hmm. obstacles to get to uh, an area that where you're essentially creating a bridge. You're filling in this hole so it, that you can get to the area where you need to plop down your characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you get some that have buttons that you need to hit to unlock gates. And there's two different kinds of gates. Ones that uh, just stay down after you hit the button, and others where you have to uh, take one of the other characters and plop them down on the gate once it's gone down to keep it down so the other character can leave the area and get to the place where you need to put all your characters at. Um, nothing really too complicated for these puzzles, but playing as one person with four characters, kind of swapping between the, the different um, different controllers. Uh, often enough, it's it can be a bit challenging to realize, like, okay, wait, this one's over here. I need to move around and get to this one. Mm. Uh, that kind of stuff, just kind of having a bit of a spinning plate kind of vibe to the way you're controlling everything. But mm. uh, it all works out pretty well. I never ran out of time on any of the puzzles uh, in spite of this. But uh, the second area I unlocked is sort of an icy area. So I'm assuming that maybe a little bit more tricky as you got uh, uh, more ice in some of these areas. Uh, but it did have a cool cool new puzzle type where instead of having a ball spawn, you're essentially creating like a snowball uh-huh. of sorts that as you're pushing around grows bigger and bigger. Then you have to have a character grab this um, this block that is a heater. Uh, you essentially just plop down next to it and it attaches to you. And you use that to Drink the ball as you go, Uh uh, because otherwise, once it gets too big, uh, it gets very hard to push. Um, But you also have to be careful, because if you eat it too much, you just shrink it all the way out of existence and have to start over again Uh on that. So there's some nice challenges on that kind of stuff. Um, But yeah, it's a a pretty neat little puzzle game. Uh, Probably better if you have more people, but it is doable to play solo if you have two controllers Uh and swap around. So that works out all right for that game. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's been fun. And I played one of the demos on the Steam Next Fest for a game called Bullionaire. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a pachinko roguelike game, uh, basically where uh, you have a sort of pyramid-shaped pachinko um, board that you're filling in with these like random little bits that um, do different things. Um, you might get a thing that bounces the ball back up. Uh, so if you can have that hit another thing that you can build up your score, which in this case is done as cash, um, to kind of build up some cash. And then you might have some that are teleporters. I had one that was, and it was a broom, a flying broom, like a witch's broom. And mm-hmm. if the ball hit it, it would latch onto it and the broom would just take it off screen, just fly off to the side. Um, there's lots of little gimmicks here. There's items that it can pick up when it hits it, and to go ahead, some that's you know different kinds of food: cheese, tomato, bread. Um, mm-hmm. Grab that. You get to hit this. Uh, um, hit this um, frying pan. Uh, then it turns into food and fills up two of the spaces around it with some food that you can fill in, and that adds potential more points. It's a lot of weird little stuff like this that you just fill up the screen with. Um, when I was playing it, uh, I kind of felt like I didn't really know what I was doing, but in sort of a Bellatro way, you're kind of moving your way through rounds, getting increasingly higher scores of cash. And after each uh, successful round that you're playing, uh, you get a chance for you know another little bit you can put on the on the screen. Uh, you can also remove stuff if you find out things are not working. Um, and you also get perks that will change the the score, that kind of stuff. So it works out uh, to be kind of just a complete nonsense game, which is kind of what Bellatro is as well. Um, and yeah, I managed to go through uh, for at least what the demo had. Uh, these three main bosses and their 
uh, rounds leading up to it and kind of getting through all of them without too much trouble. But this is also on the easy difficulty, so I wasn't too surprised that it wasn't that hard. But yeah, the I think from there I unlocked the the next hardest difficulty, like a medium difficulty. So I might check that out and play some more of that. But uh, seems pretty good for the kind of nonsense thing. Uh, because the screenshots kind of make it look like some sort of peggle thing, but you're kind of just building out this board of nonsense and seeing how it all interacts and seeing how it changes and evolves over the course of uh, your little run and seeing if you can meet the increasingly uh, higher goals that come with each round. But yeah, it's uh, it seems like it's a pretty solid game, and I think it's out later this year. I think it's only on Steam right now, but... Seems like it should be able to work on consoles just fine, but yeah, that's been uh, pretty much all I've been playing. So, Brandon, what have you been doing? Well, uh, as for me, um, I have been still playing Metaphor Refantasio, and I've gotten pretty far into it um, right now. Um, I think I'm sort of past the midway part of the game and into sort of going down the stream into the goal. But essentially... um, the game still manages to impress me as far as the writing is concerned in some genuinely incredible plot twists that have legitimately surprised me. Now, there is one plot twist that I kind of saw coming a mile away, and I think a lot of people who, before this game even came out and more sort of idea, more of what the game's description was came out, kind of called it, um... But yeah, I, I was I, I was like, yeah, I kind of figured that's what was going to end up being the case. Uh, but as far as like everything else, again, still the writing is amazing and how shockingly mature it is. I mean, I, I, I you got to remember, this is Atlas we're talking about and the Persona games, you know, the Persona games, they, you know, they will take on really dark uh you know, really dark subject matter. Um, But then they'll also intersperse it with some, eh, it's a little bit kind of juvenile humor. Um, This game doesn't do that. Uh, It, it like, it still has humor to it and it still gets funny, but it doesn't really do the weird sort of juvenile type of stuff that you see in the persona games. It's a lot more mature. It's a lot more even handed. And, A lot of times, uh, when you think they're fixing to set you up for something like that, they end up completely defying it. But, yeah, the game is just, it's really good. It's amazing. And, honestly, I, it's definitely going to be in the uh, running for Game of the Year. Um, Now, it's probably not going to win against what's probably going to be my Game of the Year, which is Astro Bot. Uh, But, speaking of which, uh, I also, uh, the... The folks behind Astrobot, they're slowly putting out a uh, series of DLC, um, which are the speedrun levels that also have, you know, new uh, bots that you can rescue. And they put out the first one this week. Um, and, you know, it, it was a speedrun level. And basically the idea is you need to first uh, go so that you can beat the level at a... You're not given, like, a specific time. But you're given, like, you beat the level, and then you're given, like, the amount of time it took, and then you are given the challenge to beat that that time again. And through that, if you get, you go through it first, you get the first bot. If you beat the time, you then get the second one. And that's basically the Astrobot DLC in a nutshell. Um, The first um, level that they've got available right now is based around the construction worlds that showed up every so often. and, you know, because it's a speed run level, that definitely means it's going to try and trip you up a couple of times. And it definitely tripped me up a few times. Um, it's not like necessarily to the kind of difficulty that like the button challenges were, but it's it, it can be it can be tricky. It can be tricky. But uh, that's what I've been playing. So, uh, Dad, what about you? Yeah, uh, for me, it's not been a whole lot. Um, I've gotten through the end of. Um... East 10, which uh, comes out um, on Tuesday, I believe. So, yeah, this game's coming out soon. Uh, The review is up on Smashpad. And the bottom line is I didn't like it as much as I liked East 9 or East 8. 
And the main re- the main reason is being because um, <clears throat> uh, your party is relegated to two people, you and uh, Karja, who is a who's a, pretty much the pirate princess. And for mm-hmm. uh, reasons in the plot, you'll you'll find out why you're only teaming up with her. But because you only have two people, you pretty much use the square button to go ahead and uh, jump between her and Adol. And um, yeah, like a lot of it is familiar from there, except that you don't have a um, block button. You know, you're limited to a a dash button that allows you to uh, not really block, but avoid a bunch of um, projectiles or attacks. And you know, when uh, team when when when, um, when paired up with with a dual mode, which allows you to uh, use both um, Adol and Karja uh, to you know um, attack at the same time by using R two. Uh, you'll be able to unlock their super mode attacks from there. Um, aside from that, like it takes it, it pretty much just uses a bunch of stuff that you know you've seen in previous E systems where, you know, when you have a whole bunch of magic attacks, you will be um, able to use them, and then from there on out, once you master them, you'll be able to use them to you in order to unlock other attacks, which you can go ahead and change them um, on your equip screen, and it's cool from there. So once you're able to go ahead and like. Um, you know, understand that battle system, you'll be able to to do that quickly. But if you were so used to what was seen in 9 and 10, it'll be a little bit hard to uh, go ahead and catch up from there. That being said, like, the game isn't bad. Um, my main disappointment comes from the fact that, you know, this is East 10. This is a milestone game. So, you know, I expected, like, a uh, a top three game in, th- in in the series. Unfortunately unfortunately for me, this this is not that. Um, that being said, like the dungeons in the game are good, the the side quests in the game are good. Um, the main thing with this one is that, you know, aside from being stuck on the same desert island that you are in the previous East games, you pretty much have an entire ocean in front of you. So, like, unlike other East games, you're not going to be shipwrecked and stuck on this one island. You actually have a whole archipelago to go through, and you know, each one of these um, <clears throat> islands can pretty much be a different dungeon. Like, you'll probably find a a rare unlock at the end of the um, uh, island you find, or you'll probably find something that'll be able to upgrade your ship. And that's where things get a little a little different here. Like you have ship battles, like um, a la the same what you'd ex- uh, the same thing that you saw in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, or maybe even you know Skull and Bones. Um, but at the same time, like they feel a little bit limiting. You know, a, a lot of times in the game you'll be able to upgrade your ship. And it'll upgrade things such as maneuverability, you know, the the, the kinds of weapons that you have. And um, <clears throat> it really isn't a whole lot of fun at the beginning of the game. Just because you'll have a lot more fun just, you know, using Adol like, and, and Karja in, in, in your typical, you know, um, dungeon crawling battles. Um, but at the same time, you know, you'll, you'll feel like your crew actually matters. Um, it takes a lot from East 8 and 9 in, in the sense of where, okay, you're going to go ahead and rescue certain people to be a part of your overall party that'll help you in the tower defense game. But if you've played 8 and 9, like the tower defense games aren't a whole lot of fun. So it's the same kind of thing here where you'll just wish that you were just, you know, doing the typical um, East stuff. And like this just does a lot of that. And like when you're, when you're you know, playing a, uh, when you're doing things that are like traditional to the East series, like it'll feel great. It'll feel like, okay, this is the game that I expected. But aside from that, like, the battle system is a little bit archaic because of what I mentioned uh, what I mentioned earlier um, and things like that. That being said, the story here is pretty solid. You know, um, uh, the game begins with all of you, with, with all of a sudden, um, you end up on uh, this hometown where all of a sudden you learn about the, the, um, the sea pirates, if you will. You learn about Karja. And, like, you'll find out that Karja is a hell of a character. Like, she is definitely, like, um, comparable to Donna from East 8, in a way. Except mm-hmm. that, unlike in East 8, um, you'll you'll pretty much, like, understand why she's useful at the end of the game. So you'll have to spend, like, 25 to 30 hours just going through the bulk of the game to find out why she's important. And when you get there, he's like, wow, she's definitely an awesome character. Um, at the same time, it's like, you're using... A version of Ed Al, who's 17 years old. This is really like the second game in the timeline, as far as that goes. And you know, you're using a you're using a, a more immature Ed Al. You're using a, a, an Ed Al who's not as experienced in the field of battle. And like, you know, you're kind of seeing that in that way. Um, but then again, like this game isn't bad by any means. It's the fact that you know we've been through so many entries, and this game doesn't feel like it really 
um, goes through some territory that we haven't seen before, aside from what's in the battle system. And that's what um, kind of comes off like, kind of comes up short in that regard. That being said, like, you know, this is an East game. It's not Trails. You know, you don't have to expect this game to go over the book of 80 hours. You can go ahead and beat this game in 25 to 30. And, you know, if you decide to just go through a lot of the side quests, all of Zelda, you'll definitely find some uh, more value here. Is it good? Yes. Is it great? No. And, you know, maybe that's my own fault for expecting something great, especially in a month that has a game like Metaphorbi Fantasio. Um, but yeah, like I would not spend like 60 bucks on this game straight up. This is more like a 40 to $30 game for me. But if you go ahead and see that, um, I would definitely die for it there. But that, that, that aside, you know, this is not a bad game by any means. And, um, you know, it definitely has that going for it. I just expected a little more and it's good in that regard. Um, that being said, um, I'm also playing a little bit of Metaphor Fantasio. I am nowhere near what Brandon is doing right now. Uh, my brother has been playing playing through it too, and he's 25 hours in as opposed to my five hours. So I don't really have much to say about the game so far. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely enjoying uh, both titles. Um, I'm in the middle, or, or I, I already finished East. It took me about um, 30 to 35 hours to finish, and I'm you know I'm excited to go ahead and jump into uh, the bulk of Metaphor. And we have um, the Dragon Quest game or the Dragon Quest remake of uh, Part Three coming out next month. So. Yeah, a lot of RPGs. Um, I'm just go ahead and I'm I'm just going ahead and get, get, getting my way through it. But even though I'm down on East uh, on East Ten, I just want to remind everybody that it's not bad. It's just rough that it comes out. You know, this late into the generation, you expect something better out of the PS5. And if you're expecting like, you know, the next generation of East, this is not it. This is more of the same. And that being said, you know, I wish there was more. But you know, that's really it there. All right. So yeah, let's get to some news. Mm-hmm. First up here, some subscription news. As Game Pass, uh, Microsoft has announced some games that are coming in the near future, the next couple of weeks. Uh, let's see, for right now, uh, let's see, for console and PC, South Park, The Fractured Butt Hole. Mm. That seems to be on uh, Standard Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Uh, let's see, for console and PC, Donut County, or... Yeah, Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Standard. Uh, that's a very fun little game there. Not super long. A uh, few hours if you need to, but that's one worth checking out. Uh, new release here, Mech Warrior 5 Clans came out uh, for PC and Xbox Series X and S on Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Um, yeah, it's the new Mech Warrior game. Uh, let's see, Elite 5 Mech Star Squad across... Diverse planets, engaging an expansive campaign with immersive gameplay and intricate combat. So, yeah, some more mech warrior combat stuff there. Uh, let's see, and that's it for the stuff available now. Uh, things coming up here in the future on October 25th uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 6, console and PC oh. on Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Uh, so, you can finally check that out and see what the, the new game here is oh. uh, for them. Um, yeah, so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, yeah. Seems like they are oh, adding Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and Warzone to the cloud uh, for Game Pass Ultimate people yeah. to check out uh, on that same day, so you can kind of fill out the launcher there, I guess. Uh, let's see, also coming up, Ashen for console and PC. This is returning uh, for Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Game Pass Standard. Uh, mm. That's the Souls-like, indie Souls-like game. Uh, for that, it's uh, the 29th. And the 30th, or 31st, Halloween Dead Island 2 for PC Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate. Mm-hmm. Uh, just for PC. Uh, I don't know if the console's already on there. Seems like it's already on console, okay. Mm. So there you go for that. You can check that out. Uh, let me see here. For November 5th, they are adding StarCraft Remastered mm. uh, for the PC and StarCraft II Campaign Collection for the PC. Uh, those are for Game Pass Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Mm. Uh, so yeah, they are adding the new remastered version of StarCraft Remastered to Game Pass. Uh, I believe the original version is free on uh, uh, Battle.net. I don't know if they're bringing that over as a free thing and just not mentioning it here. 
Um, same with StarCraft 2. They've essentially ripped out the multiplayer mm. as its own uh, launcher thing that will be free to play. And then just adding the campaigns to uh, Game Pass here mm-hmm. uh, to play on their own, which is three games worth of campaigns. So plenty of stuff there to check out if you're into RTS stuff. Um, but that seems to be largely it, uh, from what I can see here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some solid stuff there. To check out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Uh, next up here, Astrobot got a big update, uh, adding the speedrun stuff to the game uh, mm-hmm. with a special, I think, two special bots with each of the the drops here, as they are putting them out every Thursday uh, mm-hmm. for. Uh, the first five weeks here that started this past week. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, it'll end on November 14th uh, for these editions. So I imagine they may end up just keep doing this, uh, come mm-hmm. up with a new pack of levels for the speedrun stuff, because that is a, a very popular part of the game, mm-hmm. uh, especially with the way that the, the PS5 has the the built-in leaderboard stuff on the dashboard, so you can easily see when... Uh, your asshole friend beats your time, and you have to go back in and beat it to the, tell him to go fuck off. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just real quick, I also wanted to jump back into what they had on um, Xbox Game Pass. But, yeah, um, knowing what they're doing for um, Astrobot, it's pretty cool. Um, I knew they were doing this, but I didn't know they were doing it every week like this. And I remember seeing a whole bunch of... Uh, Twitter threads from like people in the industry and like, people that I'm mutual friends with, like just uh, doing all this cool stuff. And I'm like, okay, um, it's not necessarily stuff that's in my uh, cup of tea, but this is definitely cool. And I definitely see myself uh, jumping into this when I have a chance. So yeah, this is definitely cool on Team Asobi and it definitely gives um, Astrobot more value. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and just quickly jumping back to what's over coming back in Game Pass in a few weeks. Um, you know, South Park is definitely a great game to jump into if you haven't before. Donut County is great. Both me and Chris love that. Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is definitely going to be the marquee game. Um, not something that I'm too much uh, excited for, but obviously this is a big thing as far as like the rest of the gaming industry goes, and along with you know Modern Warfare 3 for those of you on cloud. But you know, jumping into Ash and Dead Island 2, these are cool games. StarCraft um, for you know people on PC is uh, definitely dope. And I also want to give some love to Throne of Liberty. Um, this was something that I played at Summer Game Fest that I really enjoyed a lot. And the reason why I'm not into it now is just because we've, you know, October has been tough as far as like a lot of the mainstream or JRPGs that we've seen this month. And if it weren't for those, I'd probably try that out. So there's a lot of cool value um, coming out in Xbox Game Pass as of late. And there's also a lot of cool stuff leaving it um, come Thanksgiving. So, or not Thanksgiving, but um, Halloween. So, you know, if you have a game, if, if, you, if you still have Game Pass, which is still the best value in gaming despite all the price increases, definitely check out what they have coming in and leaving. So, yeah. So, yeah, there you go for that. Um, oh, yeah, this uh, analog has been working on their N64 emulation console for a bit, uh, the analog 3D, and they finally have it ready to pre order. Uh, That'll be available on the 21st on Monday. Uh, Probably by the time you get this podcast, it'll be too late for you. So hopefully you saw that on your own. But uh, they are taking pre-orders at, I believe, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, And they also have controllers that they partnered with 8 to kind of create a a more uh, modern-looking controller that works with this. Um, Kind of shaped like the Pro Controller. Um, Yeah. Uh, that seems to set that up pretty well uh, to be kind of a more normal controller. That's 40 bucks for that. Uh, Apido controllers are generally pretty good. So uh, even if you're not getting the analog 3D, that's one that's probably uh, a pretty good choice to get uh, for your own. I assume there's going to be a way to hook that up to a regular N64, uh, maybe even a Switch as well to... um, Play that with a, a better controller, I think. So yeah, um, that stuff will be uh, probably something people are trying to get. Uh, Two fifty for the console, so seems like a pretty decent price for what you're getting there, because that'll make it easier to hook that up to a a modern 4K TV and have it look pretty good uh, for that versus uh, what you can do out of the box with an N64. 
uh, when those are made for you know your regular CRT four by three TVs. So yeah, yeah, like it's 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 really awesome. Like um, I am not the market for this thing, but if I was, I would totally jump on it. The thing that sets me apart is the fact that it costs two hundred and fifty dollars, and I don't know if I want yeah. to spend that much for something that where you have to use your original uh, cartridges for. And like mm. it's a little bit of a of a red flag for me because. Um, you know, I still have my 64. I still have a lot of my cartridges, but I, um, a lot of them won't play. And I don't know if it's because of my cartridge or if it's because of my N64, whether it be the cleaner or whether it be like how, you know, how clean the cartridges are. I have no idea. Like I would have to get one of these to check and I don't want to spend 250 bucks to do that. And, um, you know, the, it, it's funny because the, um, the, the leading image of this story on Kotaku is the, is the platform as well as a bunch of games. And I'm seeing like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater um, there, just sitting there, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure those were all blue. I don't think I've ever seen that game in a gray cartridge before, so I question if that's is real or if this is this is just an, an artist rendering. Um, but yeah, that does like come to mind. But you know, if you're somebody who's in the market for this, this looks great. Analog has a great track record, especially like with their uh, Game Boy Color release. Um, you know, uh, early last year. So yeah, definitely looks cool. Um, if I had a little bit more money, I'd definitely jump on this. But you know, as for what they're including, I think I'm happy with my um, N64 NSO. So mm. yeah, uh, I think those might be repro carts or something like that. Mm. They also don't have like the Nintendo branding on them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, one of them has like an ESRB logo on it. So I think there's there's something there, but. Imagine also people figure out a way to uh, allow you to load ROMs on that. So that'll probably happen at some point. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's cool. It'll be out pretty soon. Or I think it's out early next year, but it'll be available to pre-order and lock it in. Uh, but another thing that's coming out pretty soon, also in 64 related, is that the uh, Nintendo 64 app on Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack is getting a new game, Banjo-Tooie. Uh, so people will be able to check it out here on uh, the 25th. So it'll be this Friday. Play the the second of the the banjo games there. So yeah, that's cool. Mm. Yeah, I mean Banjo Kazooie. Um, it's kind of a hot take for me, but I actually liked Banjo Kazooie a whole lot more than Mario 64. Um, that was my like you know uh, goat as far as 3D platforming collectathon games. And when Banjo Tooie come out came out let me tell you so this this game's a little bit weird so banjo tooie uh correct me if i'm wrong this game is actually, is actually a game that required the um n64 uh expansion pack you know this the same thing that you know you needed uh to play donkey kong 64 and as a result like you know banjo tooie was a game that had a whole lot going for it like if you enjoyed banjo kazooie banjo tooie was better in every way but it was so much better that it was almost um it was almost uh overbearing like the worlds in banjo tui were just so large um i remember being able to you know i wouldn't call myself a uh um, a speed runner but i was able to finish banjo kazooie in a day or two but banjo tui i would not be able to do that because like a lot of times the worlds would so would, would be so big you had to like come back and uh you know conquer a few of those jigsaw puzzles um as soon as you had an ability to do so and uh, not only that, but just, you know, again, like just, just just the sheer size just made it something else. And the funny thing was that despite the fact that every single one of those worlds were bigger than what you saw in Banjo-Kazooie, this game only had 90 puzzle pieces to collect. Um, that being said, even though you only had 90, there were a whole bunch of other uh, collectibles in order to really maximize the bear and the bird. So, yeah, it's just, it's just cool to see. Um, I'm wondering how successful this ends up being because, you know, um, one of the Microsoft uh, uh, heads was on record saying, you know, uh, nobody cares about Banjo-Kazooie. And, um, you know, if you look back at Banjo-Kazooie um, debuting on Super Smash Brothers, and you look at the numbers that Banjo-Kazooie put up along with, you know, hopefully Banjo-Tooie does well too. You know, you wonder why uh, a Banjo game hasn't come out in more than a decade in the Microsoft console, despite Microsoft having the license. So, yeah, it's weird oh, yeah. to see, but yeah, hopefully this one um, definitely finds its feet on the uh, N64 NSO. It's definitely something I'll try out when I have the time to. I don't I don't right now, but again, uh, Banjo-Kazooie is very highly regarded in my life, and Banjo-Tooie is not so far behind. And yeah. in my opinion, it's a better game. 
it's just too big. And the fact that I'm saying it's too big means that, yeah, it's definitely a big Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. That'll be out pretty soon. Um, also coming out in the, the near future, Tetris Forever finally has a date, November 12th. So that'll be uh, out here in a few weeks. Uh, I am looking forward to this one. Uh, it's a pretty cool collection of a bunch of uh, Tetris games that I don't know that I've played very many of these. Um, especially because I've mainly just played like the Game Boy Tetris. Mm. Uh, until there was, uh, I, don't know, I don't know which uh, later version I would play more of, but yeah, that was probably the main one I had mm-hmm. for quite a while until maybe there were digital versions. Uh, but yeah, 15 games. Uh, a bunch of extra documentary stuff to it that looks like it's going to be a, mm-hmm. a pretty fun uh, thing here. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Mm. And then uh, the last, uh, or no, the second to last game here that we have a date for is Spider-Man 2. Uh, mm. It's finally coming to PC January 30th uh, as a, an early launch for next year, mm. uh, which would be cool to see for people that have not played it yet. Um, that game is very good. Uh, very big, very, very fun game. So yeah, uh, that'll be fun for more people to check that out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I guess uh, Insomniac is celebrating their 30th anniversary of mm. their founding, which is uh, kind of wild. Uh, they've been around for 30 years, but yeah, mm-hmm. that's uh, that's cool. And then uh, yeah, the last one here we have a date for is the Legend of Heroes. Trails Through Daybreak 2 will be out in the West on February 14th. Mm-hmm. They decided to pluck themselves right in the middle of that mess of games coming out in February. Mm. Uh, so best of luck uh, for everybody trying to check out games that cost a lot of money. Because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, a lot of uh, uh, stuff to buy for your time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that month alone, we have Assassin's Creed, we have Yakuza Pirates, you know, and now we have uh, Legend of Heroes Trails Today Break 2, which, you know, obviously me and Brandon are going to pay attention to. I don't know about everybody yeah. else. But, um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm happy that we're cool with NIS America, and we'll probably be playing this game before Valentine's Day, and that wouldn't piss my girlfriend off. Mm. But yeah, you know, for everybody else, uh, <laughs> it's definitely a, a, a fun way to go. Um it's a little. It is a little weird, um, you know. Just reading Japanese reviews, a lot of people say that uh, Daybreak Two is uh, worse than the worse than the previous one. Um, but at the same time, um, it's a it's a little bit weird because um, Trails Through Daybreak is a game that can be an entry point to plenty of people. Uh, but I have also heard from people who that have already played the Japanese version that Trails Through Daybreak Two is a game that requires. Um, knowledge of the whole series so yeah i'm pretty sure that nobody who just got into it is all of a sudden going to be caught up and that's just tough to say but also that's just trails in general and like you hope they find a way to get through it but you know the big thing about this announcement is that um yeah obviously this will come out in the early part of 2025 but you know during that nintendo direct we heard about uh trails in the sky the first coming out on switch and i'm pretty sure it'll come out on other platforms and um Trails in the Sky Kai, which is like the latest game in the series, or the second latest game in the series, is going to come out like maybe sometime this year. And definitely, you know, Falcom is finding ways to um, like break the barrier as as far as like worldwide releases, at least keeping it a year between. And uh, it'll be interesting seeing where uh, Kai comes after that. Like, I'm going to assume that uh, Trails in the Sky is late or, or is, is going to be right after this, and then then Kai will probably come in the fall. But yeah, Falcom's caught up, and that's definitely uh, something to uh, take note of moving forward. Yeah. Okay. And this is only a two and a half year old game uh, mm-hmm. when it launches, so getting that uh, gap a little bit smaller there. Mm. But uh, yeah, let's see what else we got here. We got a new Tron game mm-hmm. uh, coming from Bithel Games, Mike Bithel Studio. Uh, they made a visual novel. Uh, Tron game la- like a couple years ago, and now they've been uh, seemingly uh, done well enough with that that they've gotten the go ahead to make a uh, a bigger game, an action adventure game mm-hmm. here uh, called Tron Catalyst uh, that is set in the Arc Grid, 
introduced in Tron Identity, which was their previous game. Uh, that'll be out next year at some point on PS5, Xbox, Switch, and PC. Mm. Uh, so that'll be cool. Uh, nice to see some more, more Tron games, especially ones that are doing their own thing. Um, I feel like they mostly had to do that because the movies are not exactly that conducive to making direct adaptations of them. Yeah. Because the original Tron is kind of a snoozer uh, for yeah. the most part. Very yeah. Slow. Yeah, it's a very slow movie. I mean, even by the standards of its day, it was very moves at kind of a snail's pace. Um, yeah. I mean, and for that reason, like, I mean, the game for the Atari that they made is basically like two things. It's, you know, the, the, the motors, it's the cycles. And then that last part with the master computer, like it's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you end up getting a lot of games that have light cycle sequences or, mm-hmm. Um, some of the other vehicles that are in there and generic, you know, uh, stuff with the disc, data mm. disc, I think it is, um, uh, using it as combat. So yeah, it makes for interesting games, uh, to kind of come up with what, how you work that into a, a functional game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, as far as a Tron IP goes, um, I didn't really care for the original movie. Um, I did like Tron legacy a lot. Uh, that being said, like, you know, Tron's existence is owed to video games. And as far as I know, this is like the first video game, right? And um, yeah, it's tough to really have an opinion here. But at this, at the end of the day, uh, Bithel has a good track record as far as games go. I just don't know what to expect with this one, whether it can be something strategic or more arcadey. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, this, this is just something where I have to really just wait and see. Um, as to really like make an opinion of what's what's to come. I don't know if Tron is that strong of an IP, but it definitely has a lot of like retro respect. But I don't know how far that'll go, especially coming from an indie developer. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this seems neat. So that'll be out uh, next year. Uh, let's see. Let's get to some good industry news. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero has hit three million units sold in twenty four hours. Uh, so that's very good for them. Um, yeah, it's been a game that's been getting a lot of talk, mm. uh, especially as I think people been running into the buzzsaw and like the campaign mode, running into a uh, uh, Vegeta in his great ape form, mm. just destroying people. Um, so that's fun. Uh, I might get this at some point, maybe when it's on sale, because this is Bandai Namco after all. It'll be on sale. Mm. Um, and probably not too long. It'll be at least half off time early next year, uh, especially if you want uh, the DLC, because they are planning to pump out a lot of DLC, mm-hmm. uh, even in spite of it having 182 characters. Mm. Half of them Gokus and Vegetas, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there you go for that. That's some, some good news there. Uh, also good news, Silent Hill 2's Shipments and digital sales has topped 1 million units. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, three days, I think, of this one is. Uh, and I assume this is probably one of, if not the best selling Silent Hill game at launch, at least. Yeah. Because uh, they're typically not huge sellers mm. uh, for that. And this one has surprisingly uh, done better than, uh, let's say, the uh, the Silent Hill community would have expected as a whole. Mm. Um, there's definitely parts of the silent community that did not want this game to be good. Mm-hmm. Just kind of wallow in their misery of not getting any good games in this series for a long time. Yeah. Um, so much so that people even went and changed the review scores on the wiki page for this game. Yep. To make it look like it was lower until people fix it again. And it's like, man, people need something better to do with your time. Mm-hmm. They're going to sit here and be in this kind of toxic community mm-hmm. that you're trying to build here. Mm. Well, yeah. Uh, luckily, the game is doing well. So that's good enough for everybody. Uh, the last one here, It Takes Two, mm. has reached 20 million units sold uh, in the last uh, three years, I think it's been. Three and mm-hmm. a half years. Something like that that's been out. Um, that's pretty great. Mm. Uh, they could reach 16 million units back in March, so uh, still keeps selling really well. 
uh, adding another four in the last seven months or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, there's a uh, some good news in the industry right there. Mm. Um, but yeah, let's get to uh, some not so good news. Mm-hmm. Uh, first one up here, Tales of Kinzera Zao, uh, developer Surgeon Studios, has put the entire games team on hiatus due to their lack of funding for whatever their next project is. Um, yeah, they're all on notice. All their employees are on notice for redundancy as the people running the studio are seeking a partner for their next project. Um, but it seems like until they figure that out, they're kind of uh, laying people off, I guess. Um, these are mostly, well, some of these are people in the UK. I think they have people from around the world. Mm. Um, but there is a process they have to go through for that. But yeah, that's uh, a shame because that game is fantastic. It's well worth um, checking that out if you want to support them. Um, it's another great Metroid style game. But uh, yeah, not really too surprising that it hasn't done super well. Um, mm-hmm. They keep the studio afloat until they get their next thing going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be it would be nice if EA uh, swooped in and maybe signed them for another game. But mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like that's happening at the moment. So yeah, there you go. Mm. Some unfortunate news. Um, this next one's real kind of nasty. Um, Riot Games announced layoffs, uh, but did it in a really kind of shitty way as they announced these in a post that they called an update on how we're evolving League, uh, where they're posting, like, I want to share some important updates about League of Legends. Uh, we've made changes to our teams and how we, make, how we work to make sure we can keep improving the League experience now and for the long term. Mm-hmm. I want to be clear, we're not slowing down work on the game you love. We're investing heavily in solving today's challenges faster while also building for the future. As part of these challenges, we've made the tough decision to eliminate some roles. Mm. It isn't about reducing headcount to save money. It's about making sure we have the right expertise so that League continues to be great for another 15 years and beyond. Mm. While team effectiveness is more important than the team size, the League team will eventually be even larger than it is today. As we develop the next phase of League, the writers who are laid off are supporting them with a severance package that includes a minimum of six months' pay, annual mm-hmm. bonus, job placement assistance, health coverage, and more. So at least seems like they're doing pretty solid uh, severance for them. But mm-hmm. yeah, like couching this all is like, here's how we're making League better for you, the player kind of thing, just seems real shitty way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't make any sense. You know, you know, going back to their initial layoffs in January where they released like what, 500 people. It's wild to me that all of a sudden you feel more for um Riot when they release 500 and all of a sudden because they released 27, you think they're making the right move and I'm not saying, you know, I feel that way. I definitely don't, but it's just dumb. You know, mm. I'm going to be straight up. I actually interviewed for a role with Riot to be a community manager on Valorant a couple months ago. And I found out that a community manager on Valorant was one of these 27 fired. Um, and that sucks. You know, like, I don't know whether, or, or, well, I do know this person has been there for a couple of years. A- at the end of the day, I don't know if they actually hired for that role that I interviewed for. But at the end of the day, I'm like, how can you say this wasn't about like cutting back on budget and then all of a sudden backing that up with saying that they're going to be bigger in a few years? That makes zero sense. You know, um, League of Legends is one of the biggest live service games out there currently. Uh, Riot is, you know, despite this or, you know, in, in, in behooving of this, like they're, they're definitely one of the best live service developers and publishers out there. But like, Saying what they're saying makes absolutely no sense at all. It doesn't make any sense for Riot. It doesn't make any sense for the people who work there. And it doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense for the people that play their games. So, mm. yeah, this is totally tone deaf. And, like, it goes back to, like, my interview process with their recruiter. I'm like, you already made these layoffs in January. So what what would you say makes me believe that you won't do it in the future? And here they are doing it with a, with a role that affect with, with a with something that affected the role that I wanted. It's just... It makes no sense to me, and I just feel for, you know, whoever lost their jobs and whoever might try to pursue something there in the future. Because, you know, Riot, in my opinion, is definitely up there with 
you know, Blizzard and Microsoft and any other AAA studios that are up there as far as like, you know, trying to find a solidified role in the gaming industry. And they just proved right here that they're not. And that sucks. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they have laid off 32 people, uh, 27 from the team itself, and five uh, from the publishing side. Mm. Uh, so not a huge amount of people, but the just the way that they're doing this just seems uh, done in a really poor manner, uh, making it seem like this is what our plan for the game is for the future. Mm. It's layoffs. Like, how the hell does that help the average player of the game? Mm. Uh, which is that it does so there you go um yeah let's get one more bad story out there bandai namco is reportedly cutting uh uh, about 200 staff as they are canceling a number of titles uh i don't know if we have specific titles here but they are canceling uh several titles due to lackluster demand um, and it seems like this is layoffs in the Japanese sense, which is that they ask them to resign, mm. uh, quit. Um, yeah, it's alleged that 200 of its 1,300 employees have been moved into these expulsion rooms or Oidashi Beya. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost half of these have since voluntarily resigned. Mm. Um, yeah, they're giving them nothing to do, putting pressure on them to leave voluntarily. Uh, so they don't have to do any sort of severance or anything. Mm. Um, sounds like a very fun place to be. Yeah. Very much had me being like, no, I'll just sit here. You're going to keep paying me. I'll keep doing this. Uh, but yeah. Uh, let's see. They are. Uh, yeah, they've had half of the people, about 100 already left. Uh, trying to get another 100 to go. So that's fun. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, at the end of the day, this is a uh, it's a negative story, but mm-hmm. also like this is like one of the first ones where we see a Japanese studio actually uh, doing something bad as a result of like what's happening in you know the economy and yeah, the, the yen is bad right now. That's why we have a lot of like Americans who don't have a lot of money going to Japan for a vacation because yeah, the yen is absolutely garbage right now as far as the exchange rate, and we're seeing people benefit from that. That being mm-hmm. said. You know, um, you know, look, look, looking at what's happening in Bandai Namco or the gaming industry in general is, yeah, uh, Japan is not immune to these layoffs either, especially like, you know, you'd think they'd, they'd be doing well, especially with the success of uh, the um, Elden Ring DLC as well as uh, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. Uh, but no, there's there, there's definitely some uh, bad stuff going on as well. And it, it even affects their anime games, which is their bread and butter. And um, the funny thing about this one, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying funny loosely. I'm not saying it's funny. But like, you know, the f- I'm not saying it's a fact either, but this expulsion rooms thing is definitely hilarious to me in particular, because, you know, they aren't necessarily being laid off and they aren't necessarily being fired. Right. They're they're, they're pretty much being sent to these rooms um, in the hopes that they resign or um, anything of that nature. Right. If this yeah. were me and I'm being sent to an expulsion room, uh, I will gladly go to the expulsion room to do nothing and be paid my salary. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I, am, I am not below that at all, or I'm not above that at all. So if I'm going to make my money and not do anything, by all means, you know, I'll just go ahead and not include the work that I didn't do on my resume and I'll move forward. Um, yeah. But yeah, like this is definitely tough to see. And I know that there's definitely a different kind of culture barrier. Like, you know, the Japanese expect to go to work to, to actually work. And, you know, this will definitely affect their pride in that regard. But again, if this were me and I'm being sent to a room to do nothing and still get paid for it, I would not care. So, yeah. Yeah, it seems like the corporate version of a study hall mm-hmm. uh, kind of thing. But, yeah, it's it's a thing that I think is fairly common in Japanese companies, um, especially game devs. I think Konami used this a lot as they either had people they wanted to pressure into quitting or go work in one of their other branches that were not games-related. Uh, when they were, you know, trying to shed as many people as they could when they wanted to stop making games. Um, they may very well have been what kind of what they did with uh, Kojima towards the end of uh, Metal Gear Solid Five development uh-huh. as they separated him from the team and kind of uh, didn't allow him contact with them to, you know, finish up the game they were trying to make Yeah, uh, at a certain point. So, yeah, this is not an uncommon thing. 
Yeah, it's been rumored that this is what they what um Nintendo did to Gunpei Yokoi after the Virtual Boy fell out, which for the record turned out to not be true. He was already getting ready to leave the company anyway. But yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's a known tactic in Japanese corporate corporate culture. Yeah, um, it's not a great way to go. Mm-hmm. Um. But Bandai Namco, yeah, has been kind of in a weird place of late for releases because, like, Sandland came out. I don't know that very many people even knew that what that was, uh, much less bought it. Um, and they just keep pumping out a bunch of anime games. That way, you're like, I, I sure hope all these are doing well because otherwise, it just seems like you're making a bunch of stuff for smaller audiences that may or may not actually want them. Uh, depending on the games that they are making. I don't know if it was them. It might have been Sega that was making the... I think it was uh, Jujutsu Kaisen like Mario Party game. Mm. Uh, that was kind of a, a weird kind of game to make, but it might have done all right on its own, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, Bandai Namco, at the end of the day, is known as the anime studio. You know, they just released Dragon Ball. Um, you know, they they had the Sandland game last year, and uh, yeah, it is it, it is what it is with them. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know if I, I would dock them for going ahead and releasing stuff. Like, you know, for example, this week alone, we had Unknown 9 came out. I don't know if you or Brandon know what that game was. I don't know what that I game do. was. I do. Bre- I vaguely <laughs> remember. I do remember it from uh, the, like, one of the major, um, one of the like big showcases that was in the last few months. Yeah. I, I, I already looked, I was like, it might have some potential, but it looks pretty, pretty bland. And uh, yeah, it turned out it was a huge bomb. <laughs> yeah. And like at the end of the day, like it looks fine and fine is like not good enough. But at the end of the day, like you and I both know, all, all three of us know that we need uh, the double A, you know, B releases. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it's like, it's also like, shutting these studios down so yep. it's like okay where can they come from like can it really just come from indies and yeah that's that's just what makes it tough and um from what i've seen the game didn't review badly it's actually like pretty fair but fair is not good enough in this industry mm. and i don't know if it's a 50 or 60 dollar game which would can which would be considered budget in today's standards but it's not like bandai namco isn't doing anything you know they're mm-hmm. definitely releasing some games out to die but at the end of the day, like they're still doing stuff, and it's just it, it just sucks to see this being the result. Mm. Yeah, that one. Let's see, a fifty dollar game. Um, yeah, it just came out this past week, and yeah, it's that one's been in the some of the Jeff Keeley shows a couple times in the past year. Um, but yeah, if you want to know uh, Bandai Namco's output, this is their twenty twenty four lineup. Uh, there's Tekken Eight. Jujutsu Kaisen, Cursed Clash, Sword Art Online, Fractured Daydream, uh, Spy Anya, uh, Operation Memories, Pac-Man, Mega Tunnel, Battle, Chomp Champs, that time I got reincarnated as a slime, Isekai Chronicles, Sandland, Gundam Breaker 4, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero, and Unknown 9 Awakening. That's all in one year. Mm-hmm. As far as critic stuff goes, three of those games are good. And you know, if you have three hits a year, that should be good enough for your pub for your publishing studio, but it's not. And that's where we live right now. Yeah. And like that's uh that's a lot of games. Uh mm-hmm. you really hope that they are not huge budget games, which I think te- uh usually they are not huge budget games. Uh, as you can see from a lot of the way these games look. Uh but like I would say Sandland and Dragon Ball Sparking Zero and Tekken 8 were all probably uh, pretty high budget games. Um, probably Sandland on the bottom of that, but the other two had a lot of work put into them. Um, but yeah, they've had what? There's five already listed here for next year Fate Extra Record, Little Nightmares 3, Tales of Graces F Remastered, Freedom Wars Remastered, and the Sinduality Echo of Eda. Ada. Um, so two remasters for next year so far, but yeah, there you go. Uh, for your bad news, uh, industry news of the week. Uh-huh. Uh, we'll end here with the Xbox partner preview, which was uh, a pretty decent show. Uh-huh. Uh, I feel like it was a show where it felt like everything was either 
like a horror game or some sort of souls like style game. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of this, um, it's kind of weird. It's like, there's a couple of like, uh, other games, indie games and such that were like, Oh, this sticks out because it doesn't look like everything else mm. here, but we'll, uh, we'll work our way through this. Uh, Alan Wake two, the lake house DLC is out this week, October 22nd. Uh, mm. so you can finally check that out. That seems like they are going full in on the horror stuff. Uh, for that versus the last DLC that was all kind of uh, wacky fun stuff. Uh, let's see, we got Kronos, the new Dawn. This is the new Bloober Team game, uh, which is now getting some good vibes around it now that people like Silent Hill 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people are kind of looking at this as like a a, a nice uh, new game. Kind of looks like it's got some Dead Space vibes and such to it. Um, so that looks neat. That's out next year at some point. On a PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. There's Blind Fire, which is uh, a new multiplayer first person shooter game where it kind of takes place in more environments that are kind of dark uh, with a lot of like glowing elements to them to have other players stick out. Mm. Um, Early Access is out now on the Xbox and PC and will be out on PS5 at some point later. Uh, we get to finally see some. Uh, Gameplay of Like a Dragon Pirate Yakuza in Hawaii, mm-hmm. uh, which looks wild. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know how much it's pulling from uh, Infinite Wealth, but it looks like a lot of new areas here as you're doing a lot of actual piloting of pirate ships to get around mm-hmm. and take on enemies and all that kind of stuff. As uh, yeah, Goro Majima does not remember who he originally was, but has taken on a pirate persona here. As you did. Is, yeah. And uh, he's going around fighting a bunch of people as a result. Yep. As he uh, typically does. Yeah. Uh, with uh, at least one special guest wrestler, which is uh, Samoa Joe from AEW, yep. which I think is the first Western wrestler that they've had in uh, here. Maybe they had Kenny Omega, though. He mostly worked Japanese, uh, cool. Japanese promotions uh, for a while that game was... Uh, going until the last few years. So, um, but yeah, that's uh, that's moving. It was February twenty eighth, uh, the same time as Monster Hunter Wilds, and they moved up a week, February twenty first. Uh, so they blink. They were the ones to blink. Uh-huh. Get that game out of the way. Uh, then next we got Mouse PI for Hire. This is a game we've seen for a while. Uh, that was just on PC initially. Um, is a first person shooter. Uh, set in like a uh, uh, you know, classic like 1930s Mickey cartoon style world, mm-hmm. um, but more in terms of like ma- mice gangsters and such, like a yep, uh, maybe more mafia kind of thing going on here. But yeah, looks really nice for what it is. It's out next year at some point, it'll be on yep. everything PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, and PC. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that looks neat. Uh, Subnautica 2 was announced. This will be Xbox and PC uh, for yeah. and uh, Game Pass as well. Uh, that'll be out early access next year. Um, that one's already getting the, the shitty people complaining because the two characters they showed in the game uh, is an Asian woman and a black guy. So mm. they're mad about that. Yeah. Even though you don't see your character very much in that yeah. game. So that's fun. Yeah. Uh, then we got a trailer for Animal Well, which is out now on Xbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we got Eden Zero, which is uh, a new show, uh, or I think it's a manga that has a, an anime coming out uh, pretty recently. Um, mm-hmm. It's getting a game adaptation. This is from the, the guy that did Fairy Tale and Rave Master. And if you can't tell by just looking at it that it's by the guy who made Fairy Tale and Rave Master, then you've never seen Fairy Tale and Rave Master. <laughs> like yeah. it couldn't be more obvious that it's Hiro Mashima. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's coming to uh, PS5, Xbox, and PC. Mm. Yeah, they just confirmed PS5. Okay. That's good. Um, and yeah, that is. Uh, uh, let's see. They, mean, they announced Eternal Strands, uh, which is a Souls-like game or an action adventure game, something like that. That'll be coming to 
Game Pass uh, in early 2025. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, that's one that's looks like it's a Souls game, but it's I don't think it's uh, directly a Souls game. Oh. I think it's just action adventure game. Um, and there's Mistfall Hunter. Uh, which is only on Xbox and PC for next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a third-person PvPVE extraction action RPG. Uh, so a lot of words there. Um, so yeah, kind of a multiplayer uh, action uh, action RPG kind of game. So mm. it definitely has a lot of Souls vibes to it with a lot of the character designs and such. So yeah, there's that. Um, yeah, Wheel World got announced. This is for PlayStation, Xbox, and PC, and will be on Game Play as uh, Game Pass as well mm. uh, early next year. Uh, this is a neat looking game from Annapurna Interactive and uh, developer Messhoff, uh, which I believe is the yeah the Nidhogg developer. Mm. Um, it's an open world biking game mm-hmm. uh, where I don't know if there's a ton of story to this, but. You're kind of just uh, able to bike around and do tricks and uh, all that kind of fun stuff and mm. explore and all that and probably do some races and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. uh, looks really neat. Has a nice style to it. So that's cool. Mm. Uh, then we got a date for Phasmophobia. They've been porting this to consoles for a while now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's coming to PS5, PSVR 2, and Xbox October 29th. Mm. Uh, so we'll play that on consoles before Halloween hits. Mm. Uh, then there's The Legend of Babu, mm-hmm. an action adventure game. Uh, I don't know. Kind of looks like it has some. Uh, uh, I was trying to say that it kind of has like some Chinese developer vibes to it, but mm. yeah, they just mentioned it's inspired by fables. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that looks neat. Uh, then there's Wu Chang Fallen Feathers for Xbox, mm-hmm. PC, and Game Pass. This uh, definitely is a Souls like game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it has a lot of stuff going on. Set in the, the late Ming Dynasty, so set in China. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so more of that. Uh, that'll be out next year. And then they ended on FBC Firebreak. This is uh, what was the. Um, control spinoff multiplayer game, mm-hmm. uh, which seems like it's uh, maybe more Left 4 Dead ish kind of thing. Mm. Uh, we were playing with uh, a few people, uh, taking on a bunch of enemies in uh, one of the Federal Bureau of Control areas. Uh, yeah, this was Project Condor. So that'll be out in 2025 at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be on uh, Game Pass. I guess also on PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium as well, so mm. uh, that's cool. It'll be on both the subscription services, and uh, so people will be able to check it out without having to put money into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a game they were planning to be free to play, and then they changed their mind on that. Mm. I guess this is how they're getting uh, best of both worlds. Yep. Uh, so yeah, there's your uh, Xbox partner preview. Mm-hmm. Some pretty decent stuff there. Um, I don't know anything that's super amazing, uh, at least from what we've seen so far. But uh, yeah, anything there stuck uh, stood out for you, Brandon? Uh, the Mouse PI one is one that I've been anticipating for a little while because um, I do love that rubber hose aesthetic, and I love the idea of them putting it in a, like a fairly violent first-person shooter as well. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to see what they're going to do with that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. How about you, Dan Rub? Um, yeah, uh, I haven't had a chance to actually watch this in detail. Um, but you know, as for the highlights, the things that that definitely spoke to me were uh, Mouse PI for Hire. Uh, that one looked pretty cool. Um, I've heard a lot of things about Phasmophobia, um, especially since like my job actually requires me to watch watch a lot of Halloween streams, and Phasmophobia is like on uh, you know. Uh, 50 percent of the time so you know there's that um but that one didn't really uh speak to me the ones that definitely had my attention were you know what i just mentioned uh ghost bike and of course um uh pirate yakuza but like you know a lot of the stuff seen in pirate yakuza has been seen in 
uh, multiple Yakuza games in the past. So I'm not going to say that they've definitely broken new ground there, but they've definitely made me more excited for the game. Um, Legend of Babu also looks interesting. It looks like it might be a little bit too much, but there's definitely something there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, as I said, Real World was one that stood out to me. Um, this other stuff, I don't know. I'll probably mm-hmm. check out Subnautica 2 at some point, uh, especially if it's on Game Pass. Um, and yeah, like Mouse PI for Hire would be nice uh, to see, mm-hmm. but yeah, I don't know what else here other than stuff that'll be on Game Pass that I'll probably download and see what it is, but Mm. Uh, yeah, it was a fine preview of a, a handful of things that were coming out next year. Um, but yeah, not really too much here that we either mm-hmm. didn't already know about or uh, are pulled over, super excited for. But yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I think we'll do it there. Uh, that'll be uh, uh, the show for this week. Uh, thank you mm-hmm. to Brandon Danner for joining. Always. Uh, we'll be back. Um, next week with a new slate of news and things to talk about. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to see what we've got for releases here. Um, let's see. It's almost the end of the month. Mm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Fay Farm is coming out to PlayStation and Xbox, so that's uh, over there. Uh, Kong Survival Instinct is on PS5 and Xbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, new Kong game. Uh, yeah, Wilder Myth is coming to uh, all the consoles, so that's cool. It's a uh, like a tactical RPG kind of, almost like a and D kind of thing uh, with mm-hmm. some more branching narrative stuff to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I've heard good things about. Uh, let's see here. Wilmot works it out. I'm excited for that. Uh, get to build some puzzles. Something mm-hmm. much less stressful than managing a warehouse of crap. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, Goat Simulator 3 is coming to the PS4 and Xbox One. Mm. If you wanted to see how that game looks on worse hardware, there you go. Mm. Uh, let's see, yeah, there's a new Shin-Chan game that's kind of a, uh, like the uh, the last one. It's kind of a slice of life kind of game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Slay the Princess, the pristine cut is out. Uh, if you like your uh, horror visual novels stuff, mm-hmm. that is on the consoles. Uh, with some more content to it, so that's cool. Yep. Uh, oh, Yakuza Kiwami is out on the Switch on the 24th. Uh, so people that have not played that yet can do that. Mm. Uh, and yeah, as I said, Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is out this week. Sonic and Shadow Generations. And uh, Ease X Nordics uh, is mm. also out. Uh, so yeah, some stuff to check out. Uh, but yeah. Thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoy the show, f- uh, feel free to let friends and family know they should check it out and mm. select strangers uh, that are uh, also looking forward to some games. Mm. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Hope you have a good week ahead. We'll see you all next time. Have a good one.